Good afternoon. We want to welcome you to today's program, Latinos in the Law Voting Rights, sponsored by the Local and State Government Law Section, the Task Force on Voting Rights and Democracy, the Committee on Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, and the Committee on Continuing Legal Education of the New York State Bar Association. Today's program will run from 1 o'clock p.m. to 2 o'clock p.m. During today's program, if you want to pose a question to the speakers, please feel, feel free to use the Q&A tab in the Zoom portal, not the chat tab. At this time, I would like to turn it over to our moderator today, Martha Cruschel. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Emily, so much, as always, for all the hard work you put into um, all these programs. Really appreciate it. I'm excited today to have two colleagues from the Nassau County Bar Association join us. Um, one is the Honorable Linda K. Mejias Glover, who um, currently sits on the Court of Claims. Uh, I've known Linda for many, many years. Uh, she's one of my um, prides and joy in the profession. I knew her when she was right out of law school and she's never done anything other than make me incredibly proud. One of her achievements is starting at the Nassau County Bar Association, a very, very successful diversity and inclusion committee. She was the first chair and she did an amazing job with it. It's been everything from social events to substantive programs. And it's where I first saw this presentation. Um, also joining as a presenter is Oscar Michelin, also a colleague from the Nassau County Bar Association. And um, you have both of their resumes, but um, just in very few words, Oscar is also involved heavily in all of the diversity initiatives at the Bar Association. He has a very, very interesting private practice where he does all sorts of different um, um, types of litigation, um, including um, all sorts of wrongful incarceration and, and everything else. He's um, a, a true asset to the profession and a model for so many of our young attorneys. Um, the program that they're presenting is not a CLE program, but it very, very well could be um, because it's so um, full of a, a great legal historical overview that it's certainly CLE worthy. The purpose of these programs, however, these Fridays at one are to really have a less formal kind of presentation and just sort of get a dialogue going. And this will be the first of, of many programs that we'll be having probably on a quarterly basis involving as many sections of the New York State Bar as possible. So with that, um, Judge Mejias and, and, um, and uh, Mr. Michelin, please take it away. And um, we had chatted informally frequently, yes, put questions into the Q&A, but if you have a burning question, um, you know, they're, they're, they're very nimble as presenters and they would be happy to interact um, throughout the program. Good afternoon. Thank you, Martha, for that very warm and very, very generous introduction. Um, I am Judge Mejias Glover, and as Martha said, I'm joined by Oscar Michelin, who is not just my good friend, but my mentor and a recognized uh, champion for the rights and freedoms of not just Latinos, but for all persons of color and members of vulnerable communities. So it's really truly my honor to always be able to present with um, Oscar. Thank you to everyone who's taking the time today to uh, to watch this program. It's a program that we had previously put on through the Long Island Hispanic Bar Association for CLE credits. Uh, we did again present it um, not for CLE credits, but rather for information to the Diversity and Inclusion Committee. And now we're happy to do this again. It's sort of becoming a traveling roadshow for uh, Oscar and myself. And it's just part one of a series. We have part two that will be coming up and that addresses um, rights as they relate to education. So today's program, like I said, is part of a series. And because we only have 40 minutes, we'll only be able to give you a very brief overview of the evolution of voting rights in the United States and how Latinos have had a major role in expanding the scope of the Voting Rights Act of 1965 and how they brought to the forefront the insidious disenfranchisement practices and how these issues continue to affect uh, the Latino community. Okay. 
I need to go to the next screen. How do I do that? Okay. So the brief overview, brief overview is here. Um, we're going to follow a chronological progression of voting rights in the United States. And while there's a large body of case law that's related to voting rights in the US, we're only going to focus on two landmark cases, Katzenberg and Johnson, and then we'll follow with a discussion, a shorter discussion of two more recent cases, uh, Shelby County versus Holder and Branovich versus the DNC, which essentially rendered the Voting Rights Act powerless. We'll conclude with a discussion of the current state of the Voting Rights Act and where we'll be going from where we can go from here. And time permitting, we will try to answer as many questions as possible. Okay, Oscar, I turn it over to you. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, Martha. Thank you, Emily, and to the New York State Bar Association for, for having us and always uh, judge for presenting with me. Um, you know, I think this gets asked a lot this for this seminar because voting rights is still a very, very a hot topic uh, of import here in the country. So we're going to start with how it all began. Obviously, we fought a civil war over it. Um, and um, the side that won passed the 15th Amendment in um, 1869, ratified in 1870, and simply stated it gave uh, formerly slave and involuntary servitude uh, folks the, the right to vote. So it had two sections, and the, and the first one is what granted the right cannot be denied by any account of race color or the previous condition uh, of servitude. Relatively straightforward. Women, of course, were still out of luck uh, for another 60 years, but uh, this purportedly fixed the problem of keeping um, former Black slaves from voting. And Section 2 gave Congress the authority to enforce the article by passing appropriate legislation. So we're going to go to the next slide. Now, that, that obviously should have solved it. That, that was it, right? We got a constitutional amendment. As I said, we won a civil war over it. So, you know, former slaves should just be able to step right up to, to vote. But of course, um, it didn't work out that way. Uh, the former slave states began passing uh, a number of different types of insidious practices to deprive uh, the Black population from, from the franchise. And um, you know, they were pretty clever. They did a number of different things. Um, the most prominent was a literacy test. So if you look here on the screen, this is a literacy test from back at that, that time. Um, you either had to show a fifth grade diploma, which of course uh, no slave had, or you had to answer these 10 questions um, in 10 minutes. And if you got one of them wrong, you were not allowed to, to vote. So for Blacks, of course, who had not been um, allowed to attend school and, and couldn't read, um, this obviously prevented them from voting. But what's important is that the 15th Amendment actually worked. Before these literacy tests and these grandfather clauses, which would exclude people from the right to vote, whose father or grandfather did not vote, which of course would exclude slaves, but before those practices were put into place, uh, you saw um, many, many Blacks in former slave states get elected because obviously the population outnumbered the white population. And so um, a handful even got into Congress. They won states, they won state seats. Um, and so the, uh, the Confederate states uh, were not going to let that happen without a fight. And that's, that's when um, the state law starts to come into effect to try to undo the immediate impact of the 15th Amendment. Okay. So um, just a little bit of background to the voting rights of uh, 1965. Um, in 1776, only white men over the age of 21 who owned property had the right to vote. In 
after the Civil War, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments to the Constitution were, um, were enacted. And these are referred to as the Reconstruction or the Civil War Amendments. The 13th Amendment abolished slavery. The 14th granted citizenship to all persons or um, natural or people who were naturalized in the United States, including former slaves. Um, and the 15th Amendment removed racial barriers to voting. Um, unfortunately, the effectiveness of these amendments was eroded by state uh, and federal state laws and federal court decisions up and through the 19th century. Important decisions that um, undermined these amendments were the slaughterhouse cases in 1873, which prevented rights guaranteed under the 14th Amendment's privileges or immunities clause from being extended to rights under state law. And uh, one that we probably all know or must know is Plessy v. Ferguson, which was decided in 1896. And this originated the phrase separate but equal and gave federal approval to Jim Crow laws. So after decades of intimidation, murders, and advocacy, um, the Voting Rights Act was finally signed into legislation in 1865. Originally, legislators had hoped that within five years of its passage, the issues that were surrounding um, the 1965 Voting Rights Act would be resolved and there'd be no further need for its enforcement or related provisions. We can probably guess how that, how that turned out. We know how that turned out. So of course they were wrong and Congress had to extend the provisions um, in 1970, 1975, 1982, and uh, most recently 2007, and that was extended for 25 years. It's now expired. Um, and we'll get into a discussion about the current state of the Voting Rights Act later in the program. Two landmark Supreme Court cases that were decided just prior to the Voting Rights Act were Reynolds v. Sims and Westbury v. Sanders. Okay. In Reynolds, the court ruled that the electoral districts of state legislative chambers must be roughly equal in population. And in the decision, um, Chief Justice Warren said that there would, should have been obvious but which the court unfortunately felt required to state was that the right to vote freely for the candidate of one's choice is of the essence of a democratic society and any restrictions on that right strike at the heart of representative government. Later in Westbury, Westbury versus, the, uh, versus Sanders, the court ruled that districts in the United in the United States House of Representatives must be approximately equal in population. This case, along with Baker versus Carr and Reynolds, um, was were part of a series of Warren court cases that apply the principle of one person, one vote to U.S. legislative bodies. In writing the majority, Justice Hugo Black wrote, "No right is more precious." in a free country than that of having a voice in the election of those who make the laws under which, as good citizens, we must live. Other rights, even the most basic, are illusory if that right to vote is undermined. So that led to, and the work obviously of predominantly the African-American community um, along with white allies um, fighting with the, their, their bodies and their, and their spirit, uh, produced the Voting Rights Act of 1965, uh, really a landmark piece of legislation that uh, was made specifically to enforce the 15th Amendment um, to the Constitution. And it will, just a couple of quick sections of it, it has several, but the important ones are Section 2 specifically says that no voting qualification um, would uh, be a prerequisite to the voting. No standard practice or procedure shall be imposed or applied uh, to deny or abridge the right of a person of color to vote. Section three, authorize the attorney general to bring actions under the act and then also call for the appointment of federal examiners to come into the states and actually observe the practice and procedure of voting. Section four, uh, you can leave it on that screen for a minute, Judge. Section four uh, prohibited you know, literacy tests and other devices to exclude voters 
Section 5 said that states could then bring action to have the court declare that they were a fair uh, voting state and so that they would not be under any further federal examination if federal examination had been put into place. And uh, certain acts of Congress had, had decreed certain states um, as kind of suspect states that uh, had federal examiners come in to look at their uh, subsequent voting. Section 10 eliminated the poll tax. That was another way to keep um, the poor from voting. And Section 11 made it illegal, made it a crime not to count an otherwise qualified vote. Uh, it made it a crime to intimidate voters and voter registration. And it also actually made it illegal um, under federal law to falsely register um, to vote. Just like the 15th Amendment, <clears throat> the act had an immediate impact. But then by the end of the next year, um, a quarter of a million new Black voters had been registered. And by 1966, only four of the 13 Southern states had less than the goal, which was 50% of African Americans registered to vote. So uh, really a, a, a tremendous and powerful impact to the voter rolls. So, okay, Judge, next slide. So that the, the act was only for five years uh, with the belief that that should be long enough to enforce it. But um, as Her Honor stated, it got continually amended. In 70 and, and 75, uh, it, got, it got extended first for five years and seven years. But as it relates to this discussion, based on the work of um, Latino, predominantly Puerto Rican advocates, in 1973, I believe, amendments were brought, uh, which were codified in 75, to add protection for language minority citizens. Then in, um, in 82, it um, was again extended, and it provided how jurisdictions could bail out without having to bring an action um, to not be covered by Section 4, which was the one that allowed for federal examiners to come in. Then in, um, in 06, uh, the act was renewed, and this eliminated the provision of the voting examiners for the states. But they also recognized um, uh, voting rights champions who had helped um, secure the rights of um, minority communities since the passage of the act in 1965. And as you see, there's some names that should be very familiar, uh, Fannie Lou Hamer, Rosa Parks, Coretta Scott King. But you also see um, three uh, prominent Latinos, Cesar Chavez, who not only organized uh, union workers, uh, farm workers in California, but um, encourage them to become citizens and register to vote. Um, Willie Velasquez and Hector Garcia, who worked to um, increase the voter registration and, and brought, uh, Dr. Garcia brought uh, discrimination cases uh, relating to the Mexican population in Texas uh, to the Supreme Court. So that um, finally, that act expired. And in 2021, the, the House passed the John um, R. Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act of 2021. And it um, was trying to modernize the act as well as determine whether certain states were still subject under Section 4 to extra scrutiny um, it did not pass in the Senate, and we'll discuss that later. Um, so currently, the Voting Rights Act has um, has died by sunset provision. All right. So the first case we're going to talk about of major significance is Katzenbach versus Morgan. Um, that was decided by the Supreme Court in 1966. And it was one of the early challenges to the validity of the Voting Rights Act, particularly as it impacted Puerto Rican citizens with limited English language proficiency who were otherwise qualified voters in New York. And as a direct result of the court's decision in this case, the formerly disenfranchised Puerto Ricans who had been living in New York were able to create a, a powerful voting bloc who 
had the power then to elect many politicians, including um, Herman Badillo, who was the first Puerto Rican to be elected to serve uh, as borough president of the Bronx and the United States and was a United States representative from 1971 to 1977. And he was the first Puerto Rican mayoral candidate in a major city in the continental United States. So by way of background in 1917, the Congress had approved the jones shafroth Act, which gave Puerto Ricans in Puerto Rico US citizenship with certain limitations. Puerto Ricans living on the mainland United States um, were given full citizenship and were allowed to seek political office in the states in which they resided. The act allowed Puerto Ricans to travel between Puerto Rico and the United States mainland without a need for a passport. So this, coupled with the advent of air travel, was one of the principal factors that led to the largest wave of migration of Puerto Ricans to New York City in the 1950s, and this is known as the Great Migration. At that time, New York's election law required Puerto Ricans and other New York voters to fulfill certain literacy requirements. So at issue in this case is section 4E of the Voter Rights Act, which provides that the right to register and vote may not be denied to those individuals who have completed the sixth grade in a public school, such as those in Puerto Rico, where the predominant classroom language is a language other than English. The election laws of the state of New York, however, required all voters to have the ability to read and write English as a requisite to voting. So now, shortly after the Voting Rights um, Act was passed in 1965, um, two non-Hispanic New Yorkers, John and Christine Morgan, filed a lawsuit in the District Court for the District of Columbia, challenging the, the constitu constitutionality of Section 4E because of its conflict with New York laws restricting voting to those literate in English. In the lawsuit, the Morgans sought first a declaration that 4E was unconstitutional, and second, they sought an injunction prohibiting the then Attorney General, Nicholas Katzenbach, from either enforcing or complying with the Voting Rights Act. The district court decided a motion for summary judgment in favor of the Morgans, and the gravamen of the majority opinion of the three judge panel was that states have traditionally been the ones to determine voter eligibility, and Judge Holtzoff rejected the contention that discrimination against Spanish-speaking citizens in the form of exclusion from voting was a motive for New York's literacy test requirement since uh, or was not a motive for the, the requirement since the requirement was originally adopted in 1921, long before the large influx of Puerto Ricans into New York. So Katzenbach appealed directly to the Supreme Court, which is provided for in the Voting Rights Act, and the Supreme Court her, uh, heard oral argument on April 18, 1965 and issued its opinions on June 13, 1966. Okay. And the majority opinion, which was penned by Justice Brennan, reversed the ruling of the three-judge panel, holding that the Voting Rights Act was, in fact, a proper exercise of congressional powers under Section 5 of the 14th Amendment, and that because of the Supremacy Clause, federal law trumped and prevailed over New York English literacy uh, requirements. Section five of the 14th Amendment authorizes Congress to pass any appropriate legislation to enforce the other provisions of the 14th Amendment. And so in, in, in putting this in his opinion, he's credited with introducing what we call the ratchet theory for congressional, um, congressional um, legislation. Um, and so in, basically what this means is that Congress can ratchet up civil rights beyond what the court has recognized, but it cannot ratchet down judicially recognized rights. The court also noted that states cannot grant <clears throat> or withhold the franchise on conditions that are forbidden by the 14th Amendment or any other provision of the Constitution. Justice Brennan noted that New York had enacted by limiting 
the had acted by limiting the right to vote based on English literacy, which is an important fact because the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment has a state action requirement, meaning that a violation of equal protection by a, by a private individual without governmental action will not support a claim of a constitutional violation. Justice Brennan also stated that those who drafted Section 5 of the 14th Amendment intended to confer Congress the same broad powers expressed in the Necessary and Proper Clause of the Constitution. And he expressed the hope that Puerto Ricans as a minority in New York could, by having the right to vote, obtain non-discriminatory treatment in public services and better obtain perfect equality of civil rights and the equal protection of laws. In other words, he had shifted the focus from discrimination and voting to discrimination in the delivery of government services that might be impacted by the results of exercising the right to vote. So Katzenbeck is one of the most significant cases involving Latinos um, in the American electoral system for a number of reasons. First, it directly addressed access to the voting booth, one of the most fundamental rights in the American legal system. And second, during the civil rights movement, Congress had passed the Voting Rights Act, which made, which made New York's de jure discrimination against Puerto Ricans illegal. It's noteworthy that Latinos did not initiate this case or this litigation, um, although there was a Latino who um, initiated the companion case, Cardona, which we didn't get into, um, but rather it was two other New Yorkers who sought to continue the discriminatory practices and exclusion, uh, exclusionary practices who did in fact file this case. So as a practical matter, this case resulted in breaking down barriers to the voting booth for many Latinos and ultimately led to bilingual um, ballots and further enfranchising non-English speaking citizens. So before I, I, I get to the, the next case, um, Johnson versus DeGrandy, you know, you look at the fact that uh, it took really a hundred years from the passage of the 15th Amendment to get voting rights legislation in 1965. And that it was predominantly aimed at Southern states. Um, and yet the first case to make it to the Supreme Court uh, was from good old New York. And you know, as someone who I came from the Dominican Republic in in the early '60s um, to New York, and um, you know, the the Puerto Rican population already by that time um, was was huge in numbers. And you know, once the Voting Rights Act came into play, um, and the political power started to grow, was when obviously then instead of a literacy test, they started to really enforce the language test. But it was also then following the Asian population that had been kept out as, as well. Um, and uh, those two groups at that particular time uh, worked together to, to um, try to eliminate the, the language barrier. So the next case um, that we'll talk about is uh, Johnson versus DeGrandy. And this dealt with Cuban Americans in, uh, in Florida. And um, you can go to the next slide, Judge. And so they they brought a lawsuit um, against state officials because of the districting plan. So what happened after all these cases is in, instead of trying to pass literacy tests and instead of trying to pass laws that specifically um, prevented or intimidated minority voters, they went to the redistricting to try to disenfranchise voters by drawing districts that did not represent the population and uh, divided the population to dilute the vote. So from here forward, most of the litigation you see is in that kind of issue, what we call voter dilution. So here, um, the complaint was that the district plan of 1982 that was passed in the state of Florida violated the Equal Protection Clause and the VRA. Um, in that districts from which voters had chosen um, their representatives were not proportional um, and did not reflect the state's population in 1982. And it sought 
um, redistricting and reapportionment. You can go to the next slide. Again, remember what was happening then, large, large influxes of Cuban mi uh, migrants coming from um, Cuba directly to Miami. And so um, it was then joined, interestingly, by the NAACP, who filed a similar lawsuit that they felt both the white and Hispanic population and the way the districts were drawn had diluted the vote of African-Americans living in, in Florida. So um, after the lawsuits were filed, the state legislature actually re reaffirmed the, the lines. Um, next slide. So basically, um, like all redistricting, it's based on the census. This was based on the 1990 census. Um, it divided it into certain districts. Um, Hispanics were a majority in nine House districts and three Senate districts. So both um, the Hispanic and Black plaintiffs uh, complained that it violated Section 2 because it unlawfully uh, fragmented cohesive minority communities and it impermissibly submerged their right to vote and participate in the electoral process. In the electrical process. Um, in summary, it's a very complicated case. The, the claim was that the plan did not maximize the number of districts where Blacks and Hispanics would be the majority. That yes, some were drawn that gave Hispanics seats in both part in both chambers of the state ledge, but that um, it could have, in fact, created seven further districts of Blacks and Hispanics in um, the Miami area and the Pensacola area. So if we go to the next slide, um, the, the one before that, No, nope, I guess I have a slide that we don't. Um, so before we get to that slide, the the lower courts uh, did impose a remedial plan, uh, which created 11 majority house, uh, Hispanic House districts. Um, it did not change the Senate districts. Um, the, um, the court was split as to whether the the plan had to maximize the number of available districts that could be made, or whether it was sufficient that the, the plan was proportional to the general population. In other words, if the population was 25% Hispanic, um, as long as the, the districts were 25% Hispanic, then that was fair. Um, it didn't matter that 28% districts could have been drawn, for example. So they appealed um, to the U.S. Supreme Court um, saying that uh, more districts should have been joined. And obviously the, 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 the losing side said that the, the current plan was fine because it was proportional. And uh, the Supreme Court held that the, the district court was wrong. Um, it failed to apply the totality of the circumstances for voter dilution. And it was a misreading of um, the Gingles case, which we'll discuss a little bit later, which um, really in initiated the term of dilution through submergence. So basically what that was talking about is where you have a large Hispanic population in, in a district that would make that district a, a Hispanic majority, and you draw the line in the middle of that population so that the two districts have a small population of Hispanics, not enough to be a majority. So we, you dilute the vote through submergence into other districts. And um, the Supreme Court further held that um, because the plan met the proportion of the population, that was sufficient, that there was no requirement um, to maximize the voting strength of minorities, um, that all that was required was to be uh, proportionate to the minority population at, at, at issue. So if we go to the next slide, and the reason why we're going to we kind of discuss 
the, this case in a little bit more detail than, than others is because th this is really the key issue that continues to be addressed. And the Gingles test is continue to be the one that's kind of um, um, applied. And you have to show these three, these three conditions. The minority group has to be sufficiently large and geographically compact to constitute a majority member, majority minority member district. Um, that's called the compactness uh, requirement. The group has to be politically cohesive, uh, meaning its members have to tend to vote the same. It's not enough that they may be of the same race or national origin. You have to show that their history is that they back the same candidate. And three, the white majority votes have to be enough um, to block it um, and, and to create its own block. Um, and so that would show that the state and its districts were racially uh, polarized, that there was racial blocks in, in, in play. And so um, the court found that although um, it met um, those, those those tests, the um, the factual dispute to look at too was how many of the Hispanics that were in there uh, were appropriate of age and could actually vote, um, and whether they should have been counted in the um, in the analysis. And the court found that yes, they should have, and that was. Um, why the, the Supreme Court took the first step and said under the Gingles test, um, it did meet, uh, you know, that factor that it was subject to review for discrimination. So if we go to the next slide. Um, but what they what they said was that it was not enough just to find the potential for discrimination and an undercounting of the population. You had to go further and look at the totality of the circumstances um, and that based upon how the districts were drawn, that the um, Hispanics did not have a, let's say, a less of a pathway to the electoral process and to elected representatives of their choice um, because it fit the proportion of the Hispanic population overall. Um, and so the, um, the court held that it had to look only at the proportionality as to the minority voting age population. If we go to the next slide. And so really the, 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 the problem here was that you already started to see um, a, a court that was not in favor of the Voting Rights Act was not in favor of looking at these types of um, internal, you know, drawing of lines in in, this, in states. Felt that um, this is now a little bit further afield from where the Voting Rights Act uh, started. Okay, and if you look, um, they did an analysis as to the percentages. Um, and so you would look at, you know, what percentage uh, was the black population, what percentage was the Hispanic population. And because of the requirement of the Gingles test, um, the black population had to be counted separately from the Hispanic population because there was no evidence that they voted as a block, that blacks and Hispanics uh, cohesively as a minority group voted the same way. And that would have led to obviously more districts that were made up of Black and Hispanic uh, populations. But um, the court's line was that one may suspect dilution from political famine, but one is not entitled to suspect dilution from the failure to guarantee a political feast. So if you go to the next page, court said that states could show the, the majority could enter safe harbor by not even needing an analysis into the single member districts, if it could show that it was generally, um, did not dilute the overall population um, as to access to the, to the um, ballot box and to the elected officials of their choice. Um, you know, and so the 
it could lead, obviously, and it has to gerrymandering um, in in certain ways to um, disenfranchise certain areas. As long as the overall outcome is is proportional, um, the court was very split on this. Um, Justice O'Connor um, said that proportionality is relevant, but it shouldn't be dispositive. Um, and Justice Kennedy said that um, he believed that not the, not only does the Voting Rights Act not require maximization, um, but he didn't want any kind of remedial districting uh, whatsoever. He felt that drawing districts based on race uh, raises more constitutional questions and uh, took us further away from a goal of a political system which race no longer matters. Of course, that ignores you know the reality. And then finally, Thomas and Scalia said they would just dismiss the case outright. Um, and in, in their dissent, you know, started talking about time to end uh, any application of the Voting Rights Act. Okay, next slide. Okay, so where are we today? Um, little quote from the the Atlantic in response to the decision issued by the Supreme Court in Shelby County versus Holder. Um, they said that, uh, that this decision committed a violence against the 14th Amendment itself, which the Voting Rights Act is a distant descendant. So this landmark also is a landmark decision of the Supreme Court of the United States. And it was uh, regarding the constitutionality of two provisions of the Voting Rights Act of 1965, specifically Section 5, which requires that certain states and local governments obtain federal preclearance before implementing any changes to their voting laws or practices, which could uh, potentially harm voters, minority voters. The section, and then section 4B, which contains the coverage formula that determines which jurisdictions are subject to preclearance based on their histories of discrimination <clears throat> in voting. <clears throat> so by way of background, in 1966, the Supreme Court upheld preclearance and um, the coverage formula as constitutional, as a constitutional enforcement um, legislation under section two of the 15th amendment and that was in South Carolina versus Katzenbach. The preclearance requirement initially was set to expire five years after the enactment, but amendments like we mentioned were made, which, um, and then in 1982 reauthorized section five, 1970 and 1975 amendments also updated the coverage formula. The Supreme Court had upheld these reauthorizations as constitutional in Georgia versus the United States, City of Rome versus United States and Lopez v. Monterey County. Then in 2006, Congress reauthorized Section 5, as I mentioned, for an additional 25 years. Um, but And this did not change the coverage formula from the 1975 version. So this is important. So now shortly after the 2006 reauthorization, a Texas utility, uh, utility district sought um, to bail out from Section 5 of the preclearance requirement. And in the alternative, it also um, challenged the constitutionality of Section 5. The Supreme Court ruled unanimously in um, previously in Northwest Austin Municipal uh, Utility District Number 1 verse holder that government entities that did not register voters, such as the utility district, had the right to file suit to bail out of coverage. So, because this decision um, resolved the uh, resolved the issue of um, you know the utility districts having to comply with um, preclearance, the court invoked the constitutional avoidance principle and declined to address the constitutionality of Section Five. And notably, Judge Thomas dissented from this portion of the opinion and declared section five, uh, and would have declared section five unconstitutional. So that was the backdrop. That's at Northwest Austin Municipal Utility District case. So now in April, 2010, Shelby County in the cover district 
of Alabama filed suit against the United States Attorney General and the United States District Court um, in Washington, Washington D.C., seeking one, a declaratory judgment that sections 4B and 5 of the Voting Rights Act um, are facially unconstitutional, and two, they sought a permanent injunction against their enforcement. In September of 2011, the, the District Court for the District of Columbia upheld the constitutionality of Section 5, and in May uh, 2012, the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit agreed with the District Court. So Shelby County appealed the ruling to the Supreme Court and on um, June 25, 2013, the Supreme Court, in an opinion that was authored by Chief Justice Roberts, joined by Justices Scalia, Kennedy, Thomas, and Alito, ruled that the coverage formula in Section 4B of the Voting Rights Act, which determines which jurisdictions are covered by Section 5, is unconstitutional because it's based on an old formula. Now, as a practical matter, this means that Section 5 is inoperable until Congress enacts a new coverage formula, which the decision invited Congress to do, and as we know, has not yet um, been accomplished. The court held that Section 4B exceeded Congress's power to enforce the 14th and 15th Amendments, and it reasoned that the coverage formula conflicts with the constitutional principles of federalism and equal sovereignty of the states. Um, because the disparate treatment of the states is based on the 40-year-old facts having no logical relationship to the present day, and so it's not responsive to current needs. The court held that Congress cannot subject a state to preclearance based simply on past discrimination, and it noted that since the coverage formula was last modified in 1975, the country has changed, and while any racial discrimination in voting is too much, Congress must ensure that the legislation it passes to remedy that problem speaks to current conditions. The court declared that the 15th Amendment commands that the right to vote shall not be denied or abridged on account of <laughs> race or color, and it gives Congress the power to enforce that command. The amendment is not designed to punish for the past. Its purpose is to ensure a better future. Justice Roberts wrote that the act was immensely successful at redressing racial discrimination and integrating the voting process and noted that the U.S. has made great progress thanks to the act, but he added that if Congress had started from scratch in 2006, it plainly could not have enacted the present coverage formula. So according to the court, regardless of how to look at the record, it stated no one can fairly say that it shows anything approaching the pervasive or flagrant or widespread and rampant discrimination that faced Congress in 1965, and that clearly the covered jurisdictions um, from the rest of the nation. Now, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg wrote the dissenting opinion that was joined by Justices Pryor, uh, I'm sorry, Breyer, Sotomayor, and Kagan, and they um, would have held that Congress had sufficient evidence before it to determine that the coverage formula remained responsive to current needs. And the dissent uh, acknowledged that discrimination in voting had decreased and in the coverage jurisdiction since the Voting Rights Act, um, but it attributed much of that decrease to the act itself, noting that preclearance, noting that throwing out preclearance when it has worked and is continuing to work to stop discriminatory changes is like throwing away your umbrella in a rainstorm because you're not getting wet. So really there can be little argument that against um, that the ruling, that this ruling made it a lot easier for state officials to, and to make it harder for ethnic minorities um, and voters to vote and, re and research also shows that preclearance led to the increases in minority um, representation and minority turnout. So I turn it over to my colleague. So the, uh, the, you know, it's interesting that because the act was so successful, basically judge Roberts said, we don't need it anymore. Um, and not realizing that we don't need it anymore because the act is successful. 
that's why it should have been kept in, kept in place. But uh, the final nail in the coffin was uh, Baranovich versus the DNC, which was decided in July of 2021. And once again, um, you see that the voting rights cases that are coming up to, to prominence um, about minority districts are predominantly now from Latino minority districts, like in Texas, where we just had Shelby, um, and here, Arizona. So um, here, the the um, the state had done away with uh, certain forms of uh, of voting. Um, we can go to the next slide. So one banned the collection of absentee ballots by anyone other than a relative, uh, and the other threw out any ballots that were cast in the wrong precinct before. If someone brought a vote to the wrong precinct, that precinct brought it over to the right precinct, the vote was counted. And of course, section two said you're not supposed to not, you know, count otherwise, not, not discount an otherwise qualified vote. Um, the federal appeals court threw out both provisions saying it violated uh, the Voting Rights Act because it had an unequal impact on uh, minority voters, and there was no evidence of fraud that would have justified um, their use. So um, the court, along ideological lines, 6-3 at that time, um, reinstated the state laws, declaring that unequal impact on minorities was relatively minor. Um, other states have similar laws, and uh, a state does not have to wait until fraud occurs. So the plaintiffs had shown that there was almost no evidence of voter fraud, but a disparate impact on minority voters. And so uh, a leader wrote, just because it may be inconvenient for some to vote, it doesn't mean that the access to voting is unequal. And shockingly, he said, courts should look back at to what the Voting Act required in terms of how voting was done in 1982 when the section um, that was being litigated against was actually um, enacted. So the um, he said in 1982, um, everybody voted in person and everybody voted on election day. So therefore, you know, how could you possibly say that the law uh, was passed to disenfranchise um, minorities by getting rid of absentee ballots and by uh, mail-in ballots that ended up at the wrong precinct. So um, Judge Kagan, writing for the for the for the dissent, wrote a scathing uh, forty-one page dissent, saying that um, this was basically crafting, redrafting the Voting Rights Act. Um, Section two makes very clear that voter suppression, um, you know, was the key to the act. Uh, the court treated it basically as a relic of history, which was not was not the case. Um, and in any case, it should be up to Congress to decide whether um, it was time to repeal the law or not. And so um, it really, you know, th this was, if you go to the next slide, this was seen as kind of the last of the um, effectiveness of the Voting Rights Act. Um, obviously, the uh, the president said he was deeply disappointed. Uh, in the span of eight years, those are the two decisions between Shelby and uh, Baranovich. The court has done complete damage or severe damage to the two most important provisions of the Voting Rights Act. And um, after all it took, 100 years and more to get there, um, you know, it was it was a, a shameful decision. The NAACP, which always joined uh, both of those actions as amicus um, and provided legal counsel, stated that it's a clear message that voter suppression around the country will go unchecked um, as long as they could, um, even if the voting restrictions had a disproportionate impact on, on voters of, of color. Next slide. Okay. All right. So, so what can be done? 
Um, <clears throat> as we discussed after Shelby County um, versus Holder was decided, the Supreme Court, um, by the Supreme Court, uh, many states enacted new restrictive laws regarding the right to vote. And within five years of that decision, nearly 1,000 U.S. polling places had been closed, and many of them being in predominantly African-American communities and counties. Um, and less than 24 hours after the decision was issued and announced, Texas announced that it would put in place a strict voter ID law, and many other states um, that were previously not allowed to enact voter ID laws because of the um, Voting Rights Act's uh, federal preclearance requirement were now able to do so. So the Supreme Court decision also led to an increase in voters being purged from voter polls. Now, research from the Brennan Center suggests that some uh, 2 million or more people were purged from voter rolls between 2012 and 2016. Um, and this would not have been done had Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act been left in place. Uh, notably, North Carolina passed a bill which put a strict photo ID requirement um, in place, eliminated same-day voting registration, and shortened the early um, voting period, among other restrictive policy policies. And one of the one policy in particular, uh, which banned early voting on Sundays um, in certain counties in North Carolina. Um, it was offered that it was likely that these were this was to eliminate um, voting in higher black uh, population counties. So this was struck down by the Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit on the basis that the law was designed to target African Americans with almost surgical precision. So what can be done to prevent more restrictive laws from being passed without federal preclearance? So Congress needs to make a new uh, or create a new formula for the preclearance. And in this way, they would satisfy um, the Shelby v. County, uh, Shelby County versus Holder decision. Um, and this is exactly what the John Lewis Voting Rights Act was written to do. Um, the John R. Lewis Voting Rights Act Advancement, uh, Voting Rights Advancement Act of 2021 was written in response to Shelby County and it proposed voting rights legislation um, which would restore and strengthen parts of the Voting Rights Act of 1965, most notably this pre-clearance requirement that certain jurisdictions must seek federal approval before being able to enact certain changes to their voting laws. So the first provision of the John Lewis Voting Rights Act strengthens voter protections in Section 2, and this is in response to Bronovich versus Democratic National Committee. The next portion in the John Lewis Voting Rights Act broadens cases in which the U.S. Uh, Attorney General may send federal observers to jurisdictions um, the court deems uh, courts deem necessary, as well as allow for courts to block all new election policy in a wider range of circumstances. The next portion of the John Lewis Voting Rights Act broadens cases in which the U.S. Attorney General, um, I'm sorry, uh, the next portion reinstates the federal preclearance requirement for new election procedures in certain states by creating a new formula that um, satisfies the Shelby decision. And the bill would also um, expand the changes to election procedure that would require federal preclearance, occasionally with unique standards for being subject to uh, requirements. So for example, the percentage of the population that's considered a racial minority. Um, the bill allows for both the attorney general or any ordinary person to sue a state if they believe they are avoiding federal preclearance. And it says that a three judge panel will determine if a policy needs federal preclearance. Um, and notably, until the court has made a determination, the policy is blocked from going into effect. So in, two, in August of 2021, the House of Representatives passed the bill by a margin of 219 to 212. And then later in November of 2021, the bill failed to pass the Senate after falling short of the 60 votes needed to invoke uh, cloture. Um, the second attempt to pass it on January 19, 2022, 
that was my birthday, as part of the combined bill with the Freedom to Vote Act failed as well. Um, again, falling short of the 60 votes. Um, so after the 2020 presidential, uh, presidential election and efforts to overturn it, uh, many Republican-controlled state legislatures began passing bills that made it harder to vote, which opponents of the bill alleged would disp disproportionately deter racial minorities. And um, in, in New York, in our state, Governor Hochul signed the landmark John R. Lewis Voting Rights Act of New York into law on June 20th, 2022, uh, which establishes the, the most expansive state level voting rights act in the country. It expands access to voting by prohibiting voter dilution, suppression, intimidation, deception, or obstruction. And it requires jurisdiction, jurisdictions with a history of civil or voting rights violations to seek preclearance for changes to important election policies. So. So I just wanna add that, you know, every day you read in the paper, a uh, new methods just yesterday, South Carolina uh, representative proposed the bill to limit voting on campus, on college campuses, uh, to eliminate absentee voting, uh, to eliminate early voting, um, you know, and, you know, laws were passed uh, in Georgia to replace elected um, superintendents of the elections to be appointment uh, positions, which led to, um, I think, uh, four or five uh, African-American elected election superintendents losing their, losing their positions. So, you know, this is something that's happening um, every day. Um, and we thought it was important for everyone to know kind of like how we got here, what role Latinos played, and that, you know, we work with an organization called Voto Latino, very prominent here in Nassau and Suffolk to try to help get out, get out the vote. Um, but we thank everybody for your time and for I the really presentation. Wanna, um, uh, thank you so much, Judge Mejias. And, and, um, and Oscar for a great, really, I learned another whole set of level from the first time I saw this, which I really appreciate. And I just want to note that as Emily had said in the beginning, this is recorded, it's archived, it will be available for all New York State Bar Association members, which is really terrific. And that's one of the best things about, you know, doing things this way is that we can get people to attend. For the attendees, welcome. We're hope, we hope that you enjoyed this. And again, um, a lot of thanks to our panelists. And Emily, thanks as always for just uh, making sure that every little detail goes great. I so appreciate it. Thank you, have thank a great you weekend. so much. Thank, thank you, everybody. everyone. Have a great weekend. Take care. Bye-bye.